View from the Gutters, episode 148. Welcome to View from the Gutters, the comic book podcast where each episode we discuss a collected edition, trade paperback, or graphic novel and then recommend and vote on the book for the next episode. Warning, the discussion portion of this show has massive spoilers for that book. On this episode, we discuss The Sixth Gun by Cullen Bunn and Brian Hurt. Thank you to all of our Patreon sponsors for contributing to the show, and especially to this week's episode sponsor, Addison Appleby. To skip ahead to the recommendation section, skip to... 5107. Maybe. Maybe I don't want to get the show on the road. I'm falling asleep at 10 o'clock, so... Okay. Well, (laughs) welcome to View from the Gutters, episode 148. I'm Tobias Panchin. I'm Joe Preddy. I'm Kaylee Fleeman. I'm Adam Panchin. And we are back once again. Uh, We have retrieved Kaylee from the Stygian Abyss that she had fallen into the the other three i have no earthly idea where they could possibly be yeah, it's man. worse two days before California. christmas as we record this yeah right and since i it's an the utter book mystery I, since the book i pitched got picked i volunteered to be first in line to fill in so here i am again hello everybody hey brother how you doing yo so joe you had a quick announcement that you wanted to get off your chest i did uh this uh Recently, I guest uh, appeared on a panel show, uh, Radio vs. the Martians. Uh, you can find him on Facebook, uh, and we talk about Batman. Uh, this, this is uh, another podcast. It's another podcast, yes. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a bit different from ours because it's a panel show, so there's, uh, the format's a lot different. But I think we had a really great conversation, and I had a ton of fun. Really enjoyed hanging out with uh, Mike and Casey. Um, who are the guys that do it? And uh, I think we had an awesome conversation about Batman. And uh, I got to say a few things that I don't get to say on this show because I think we're a little bit more uh, t- because Toby won't let me. That's why. All right. <laughs> so. Yeah, I'm, I'm sitting here with the censor button, waiting, waiting to make <laughs> duck quacks if you try and say anything about Batman. Um, but uh, yeah, it was good. So check them out and check out their Facebook and give them a like. They also do a podcast called uh, Podcast La Vista, which is a retrospective of the amazing films of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Awesome. So yeah, give them some love. I, and... I guess I should probably also retroactively make an announcement that after... John was kind enough to guest star on our last episode. I actually sat down with him and Dylan over on Arc Reactions, and we talked about Jessica Jones. And so that was a lot of fun, and you should check that out as well. Is it going up soon? I understand they usually have some delay, or am I misremembering? No, their their episode... (laughs) So we recorded our last episode on Wednesday. Then I recorded with them on Saturday. They put their episode out on Sunday, and then our right. episode went out on Monday. So it's, we recorded with John first, but our episode went up second, which is why there's no announcement. They, those guys do a ton of. Yeah, they have their episode scheduled out like a year in advance, yeah. what they're going to be doing. All right. And we have nowhere near that level of planning because- We pitch books. Fuck it. <laughs> Gotta you respond hear, to what's new. Did you hear the hot. subtle level of defeat in his voice when <laughs> he said that? There was nothing subtle about it. <laughs> so, the sixth gun. Yes, Adam, you pitched this book. So, what are your thoughts on the sixth gun? Tell us well why why you pitched it and what you like about it. The the sixth gun first crossed my hands a couple years ago before the run completed, and then I lost track of it, and I've still not caught up with it, because I think it's finished now. A lot of the things that get pitched on this show are things that were influential, or definitive for a character, or are good examples of a certain period, or style, or genre, or more, I should say, iconic examples. The Sixth Gun is none of these. It's a supernatural western, which is not a Huge genre, but certainly not a super small one. Uh, 
It's a very well done, very fun example of a supernatural Western. But that said, I don't think I could say it is a genre defining one. If anything, it's as interesting both for being fun and well done with good characters as the thing that put Cullen Bunn on the map. Cullen Bunn is one of those independent creators that Marvel has been aggressively courting and grooming over the last few years, throwing miniseries and one-shots and fill-in runs at them. And I believe next month, uh, he starts a Uncanny X-Men run for Marvel with Greg Land. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I so, think I heard about that. Uh, this is where Cullen Bunn is getting his real start from. So that's the context. But for the sixth gun itself, especially focusing just on the first two volumes, which are all that's fresh in my mind right now, it's a supernatural Western. There are people fighting over magic guns that are also the seals of the apocalypse. And there's all sorts of undead and spirits and thunderbirds and stuff. And it's a pretty good read. Yeah, I, I guess I'm going to put this immediately in a role-playing game context. Reading this book immediately reminded me of Deadlands. That I mentioned Deadlands when I pitched it last it, week. It honestly, to, to me at least, feels like somebody's Deadlands campaign that they're like, okay, this is cool. I'm going to make a comic book out of this. Yeah, and it does have a bit of that uh, throwing together characters of various interests. And it's like, oh, hey, here's this random guy who's in charge of the fort you've gone to. Only now he's sticking around and he's got a past and he's got more skills than you thought at first. So, yeah, it, it feels like the the best parts of an RPG. Yeah, game. well, I mean, between volume one and two, he definitely upgrades from NPC to PC. Mm -hmm. and picks up a few character levels and suddenly he's like oh he actually studies books and he has knowledge about magic yeah well you know he's gonna join your party <laughs> like i mean if we're sticking to rpg you know you always go whenever you go into a new place the, especially if you're at the beginning of your adventure the first person you run into is normally not necessarily i feel like I mean, if we were really going to put these in RPG terms, this is one of those characters where the, you, you expect it to be a throwaway character. Like, oh, yeah, he's the guy who's in charge of the base when you go in. Except the players, like, really like him. And so you write him into the story more. Like, when you have a breakout character in a TV show or a movie that the fans really respond yeah. to, and you're like, okay, well, let's let's keep this and character And I wouldn't going. put it past... Uh that being some similar to what Bun did, where he wrote him in a smaller role and then said, hey, I can use this guy, and he stuck around for the next volume. And what strikes me most about the Six Gun is not, hey, yeah, it's saying these important things, or it's, you know, really tackling these issues. It's all the little things that are just, hey, that's a really cool moment. Like in the first volume, one of the bad guys has a magic gun that gives her super regeneration. So one of the good guys cuts off the hand holding the gun. And the hand, because it's holding the super regeneration gun, grows a new person. Who then quickly disposes of the old body so that the new one is the predominant one. Yeah, that, that was actually really cool. And made me immediately think Cullen Bunch should be writing Wolverine because he gets it. Mm-hmm. Or Lobo. <laughs> what did, uh, Kaylee, Joe, what did you two think of it? I, so, like, as, as I've been um, shelving at Gabby's and stuff, I've seen the Six Gun a lot, mm -hmm. but only the spine of it. And I don't know why, but I had it in my head that it was something else entirely. I think somebody recommended it to me, somebody whose opinion I don't trust, because it tends to happen to me with books. Um <laughs> I like didn't trust their opinion, just assumed, oh, this is probably shit, mm. um, and never picked it up. And I was reading it kind of begrudgingly um, last night, and it was like, oh, shit, this is a Western. 
a supernatural western <laughs> with a magical girl. Like, why the fuck hasn't anybody told me this about this book? Why would you just be like, oh, yeah, it's like a western. Like, there's some gunslingers or whatever. It's like, that's not the most important part about that. <laughs> magical girl. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. voodoo priest. Come on. Like, this is... This is good shit. Yeah, this is exactly up my alley. Um, but I really enjoy it. It reminds me a lot of um, Hellboy and Atomic Robo and The Goon, sort of, which are all kind of favorites of mine as far as, like, the art style and, like, the way action is, is placed, not above storyline, but as sort of, like, look at these people who are good at what they're doing, doing what they do. And I I enjoyed it. Well, where the plot doesn't revolve around, can he make the shot? It's <laughs> who's shooting who and why. Yeah. I think <clears throat> what this brings to mind for me is a much better, much more compelling Pirates of the uh, Caribbean. Excuse you. Um, Those films are perfect. So, I this had been pitched, Cade pitched the Six Gun pretty early. Yeah, this has been pitched... I think a few times. Yeah. Kate has pitched it. I think maybe I I pitched it too pitched after it. I read okay. the first part of the first trade. Uh, and I know that Cade was considering this for a long run pick, so we may come back to this sooner rather than later for the yeah. to to look at the whole thing. Well, it's wrapping up in June, from what I can tell. So, All right, so it's not so quite. It'll done be yet. episode issue fifty. Will be the last, and that's solicited for June. Yeah. Right. So by know. the time we get around to Cade's next pick, which is probably going to be in about six months it it should be just finished yeah so and i it's interesting to me because i think this book it's it is very much a book in how it's pitched it's not this isn't just a western you could pitch it as just a western but you wouldn't really be doing the book justice no because it, it's set in that time period and that low some of those locations but the story is not a western story yeah so I think that it's 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 very much a story about that has a lot of those tropes that are consistent with the Western, but then you've got awesome magic guns, which kind of I think you need because mm -hmm. you can tell. Yeah, I think a lot of people try and do westerns, but I don't necessarily think it's it's a genre that's heavily romanticized. But just because I think I, I think that just because you have a good idea for a western doesn't mean you're going to make a good western comic. Well, because it, a lot of that that uh, ground has been well worn. Oh so. yeah, yeah. Well, I think western as a genre is really interesting because it was so popular so quickly on the heels of when these events were actually happening. Yeah, yeah. westerns were huge in. What the forties, the fifties, the sixties, even earlier. Well, I yeah, mean, they, earlier. They were they were actually trotting out like Geronimo and something at some of these cowboy and Indian yeah, shows. Yeah, that, that the people who actually participated in the Wild West, Geronimo and Wild Bill Hickok, and um, w the woman um, Mary something yeah. or Annie Oakley, yes. Annie Oakley. Like a lot of these people were still alive when westerns were big. They were active participants in its romanticization. Um, I and I, say that and I think right. that Joe is right in so far as we westerns kind of got worn down. They they did them so much and in so many different ways that you kind of burnt them out. And that people are now going back and doing supernatural westerns to add something into the mix. And you really don't see much in the way of just straight up westerns anymore. Anytime that you see something that is a western, it's got some additional element of something mixed into it. Yeah, fantasy or steampunk or whatever. But I think Kaylee was spot on saying that this is akin to Hellboy and Atomic Robo, where it's bringing in not quite fantasy but the fantastic where it isn't your tolkienian high fantasy but it's you know it's bringing in the stuff that gaming often deals with the uh, the myths and stories are all or at least mostly true that there are boogeymen and spirits and ghosts and demons out there yeah that it's sort of the modern occult genre or urban fantasy projected back in time yeah well what, what was most interesting to me about this series is that it 
it didn't grab me with its vibe or its style. There weren't moments where I went, oh my God, that's just so awesome in the way that I did with something like Pretty Deadly, which is similar to this in a lot of ways. Um, It kind of grabbed me more just through solid storytelling and a really great sense of what it wanted to be. And good characters, not, you know, characters who are not overly posturing. I did totally call from like the first second that uh, the four guns were hit inside Clay Gollum. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill John. Bill John, yeah. 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 Like the the very first second I saw that, I'm like, oh, he hit him inside the Gollum. Mm Mm-hmm. So that kind of ruined the surprise a little bit for me. Yeah. I'm I'm also assuming somewhere down the line there is a seventh gun, since the parallels with the seven seals of the apocalypse is so direct and so in your face. I I mean, there's got to be one somewhere in there. And maybe, I know, Joe, you read ahead. Um, oh yeah but i mean don't spoil it for me but just give me a a nod of your head if something like this has happened i can see why you and i i kind of expected it too but i mean it kind of plays out in a very specific way so i think that i i i definitely uh, without spoilers or anything it feels like that's the direction that they're going in, but it definitely feels like they want to give it their own spin. So without yeah. answering definitively on air. Okay. Um, Cause I sat down to read this the other day. I've been homesick uh, since we last recorded. I've been very ill and I've had about as much as I could stand of playing fallout four. And I didn't possible? really want to put, well, no, not that I, I found, I actually found a rocket powered sledgehammer today. <laughs> and now all I want to do is kill things with my rocket powered sledgehammer. Um, but, uh, this was before the rocket powered sledgehammer. Mm -hmm. So, um, basically I sat down to read the first two trades and I just read all seven, well, eight are out. I read all seven that I had and then tried to get my hands on eight and wasn't able to get one of the issues, but I just, it, it's a story that wants you to read it. it. At no point does it. And I like this because you see this in the first two issues, but the things I like about it is that it never gets bogged down. A lot of these stories, especially if they're redemptive, because I think it is Drake Sinclair is, you know, this is it's very much and you can see it in the beginning. This is a man that is trying to redeem himself. And that's what I think the second book sets up is he's never been that person before. He's really got no idea how to be that person, but he knows that now he's in the big leagues and he cannot fuck up. Well, it's interesting to me because he doesn't seem like somebody who believes that he's on a redemptive path. He's somebody who's convinced that he's damned and all he can do is try and make up, you know, clear enough red, as much red off his ledger as he can before his time comes. Basically, John Constantine in the West. Or he's, uh, um, uh, fucking just right out of my head. But yeah, I think, and I, I think, uh, once again, without giving spoilers or anything, one of the things I think Cullen Bunn does really well is that he never lets it get bogged down by that. And when you read that second volume, it's, it's easy to kind of think, oh, I know how this is going to go, but it, it really doesn't like. The pacing is excellent. The pacing is really, really good. And I mean, the ca- the characters aren't super memorable, but they're all engaging. I want to see what they'll do next. I believe when they do things that these are what are natural for these characters to do. And, uh, you know, as I said at the beginning, I can see that this is an early work by somebody with a lot of promise. And I think that that's what Marvel saw as well and why they've been courting him. Well, he did Defenders, didn't he? With Valkyrie and... Yeah, Fearless uh, Defenders, which which you and I both really love. Yeah, I thought it was really good. It definitely had uh, problems. It was a sophomore work, but they weren't the kind of problems that... Well, I think more, more it was the problem that he didn't necessarily have enough latitude 
to really go where he wanted to go with the story or make it as important as he wanted to make it with the characters that he had available to him, which is why it's interesting to me that he's going to be writing X-Men, because I think that he's somebody who could really take that somewhere far. Not just X-Men, but Uncanny X-Men, which right. is the flagship title. Right. Well, one, you know, one of the things about the X-Men is that they have been largely defined by the Claremont era, the soap opera. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And... Just reading the beginning of this, it feels like he could really do a good ongoing X-Men, like, you know, issue, 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 serialized, ongoing, not six-issue arc with introduction, climax, denouement, right. over and over and over again, but just, you know, the long haul. Yeah, He, he feels like a writer who's really suited to... That kind of storytelling, which is something that I think we've lost a lot of in the superhero genre in the Too last- Too much writing for trade? Yeah, in the last 10 years. As much as I love that they're telling longer stories, it, it really has become a case of what used to be one issue is now a six-issue arc because you're writing for the trade. Well, and yes. I think that he's somebody who can really dig their dig, dig his teeth into the serialized nature of comic books and tell a great 100-issue arc. I think he definitely could. And I, I mean... Well, I don't think anybody's going to do a 100-issue run anymore. Well, well, I mean, you don't know. I mean, Jeff Johns wrote Green Lantern for, what, like 10 or 15 years? Yeah. Has it been I that mean, long, I, I agree with Adam in the sense that Marvel probably won't let it happen because, you know, Marvel's got... Their, their issues right now seem to be just kind of like doing this thing where it's like, okay, it's been three years. We need a new number one. We need a new creative team. Blah, blah. And it's kind of like, I think that that does when, when you're working within this very limited space that is comic book continuity, it's very hard to be like, all right, well, we're going to take this character from here to here and we can't do anything too major because if we do something too major, then we're going to have to deal with that here. And eventually it's like, how do you have that life-changing event in a serial? This has always been the problem with modern serialized comics is it's only a matter of time before somebody's like, oh yeah, that r- r- crazy thing that happened that defined our character for five years. It's not a thing anymore. We're not going to, we're not going to, we're just going to pretend like it didn't happen. Right. Well, that's why I think it's, it's interesting in a way that, you know, people try and write that big character moment like, oh yeah, I, I'm going to do a six issue or a 12 issue thing. And I'm going to do this really important thing with this character. That's going to redefine what they do. And it's like, no, that's something that you build up over 20, 30, 40 issues of developing a character and something happens and then something happens in response to that that. was my issue with uh, the series we did last week if you'll recall yeah in some ways yeah and you know part of it is marvel is rotating people pretty regularly to keep things fresh but on the other hand they seem willing to let things stick as long as they're doing well yeah or until either they get stale or the creative team gets tired. Like, they, they kept Wade on Daredevil for quite a long time. I don't think Ms. Marvel's creative t- team is going to be changing anytime soon. Yeah, Captain Marvel, too. I think that they're going to let Kelly Sue run with her as long as she wants to. No, mm-hmm. hers is over, isn't it? Is it? Yeah, pretty sure. Okay, it's well, I mean, right. there is not a Captain Marvel series right now, as far as I'm aware. Yeah, uh, have, there's a new But they're coming, one. they're kind of bringing titles online slowly, so yeah, I know there's I, that's one right. I, in the I pipe. Think, I think Kelly Sue DeConnick's run on Captain Marvel is finally over. Oh, all right. Well, I mean, certainly that she's she's been on that title for a while now. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I do think that we should kind of circle back around to the sixth gun Mm because i mean there's certainly plenty that we haven't talked about yet and i guess i wanted to talk a little bit about the world building in particular the the creatures of the underworld or the spirit world if you will Mm -hmm. um i really really liked the uh the guy at the crossroads who you can bribe with what was it rum 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 i mean that's that's straight out of uh voodoo in I mean, I think he might have been, um, what's it? Uh, Baron Semity or yeah. Papa something. No, he there. had a name. Yeah, but well, they've all got it's lots like, of y- names. Y- okay or yeah, something. but he wasn't, Baron Semity doesn't usually present like that. As well, in my experience right. with him. L- let's say I've, I've looked into this stuff sometimes, and then it's all gone out of my head because I haven't looked at it in years. 
But yeah, I mean, the, the gunpowder and rum I know is straight out of that tradition. Yeah, well, reading it immediately, my mind said there, there's got to be, this has to be something. He's not just pulling this out of whole cloth. And so I looked up rum and gunpowder and all I found was that like back in the age of sail, sailors would mix gunpowder with their rum in order to determine if it had been watered down. Mm-hmm. Um, which is actually where we get the word proof from in terms of like, you know, this, this alcohol is 80 proof or a hundred proof or yeah. whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it comes weirdly from gunpowder. Proof. Well, so for alcohol proof, there's, it's one of those words that's not clear. A lot of people think it's from something like that or when distilleries would basically send booze out and the delivery men would drink it and then fill it back up with water. And so then to avert that so that they couldn't do that, basically they started doing that at the distillery so that you couldn't do that because then you would just water down the booze too much. Yep. But it's one of those words that's kind of like, it's got a very... All the cases of proof meaning different things out there, it all originally meant proved something, like bulletproof used to be when the armorers would shoot their armor with a gun, and you'd have the bullet dent on the armor where the bullet didn't go through, and that was the proof that the armor was bullet resistant. Yeah. I was trying to find the name of that, of like the crossroads theme. Kalfu. Oh, okay. Well, that's who it is in the cup. Co- okay. I but, went and um, looked it up. No, I just super love the idea of, and I, I feel like I've talked about this on other comics too, uh, just bringing in lore and actually using it. Um, because lore is just fantastic. Um, the things that we come up with in Americana culture, or even other cultures, it's just, it's it's fantastic. And honestly, like, it being shaped over decades of being retold, it's way more interesting and in-depth than something a single writer can come up with on their own, uh, especially for, like, a one-off creature. And mm-hmm. so I really love when authors use that and use, the, use those advantages of this well-established creature demon. And I think... Um, all of the scenes like in the bog really play to that, especially with like the idea of the the ghost children and things like that, that kind of come up. It's like, Oh, I, I see what's going on. It's really similar. Even if you don't know it, you, it feels like it's a cohesive whole where the author isn't just pulling things out of their ass. Yeah. It's convenient. Yeah. And that's the same with goners. Like I really, really love goners and uh, it's the same sort of thing. It's pulling these creatures that have existed in our folklore for centuries. Well, it's really cool to see somebody take all of those disparate elements and kind of draw connections between them in a way that feels like it makes sense. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, to, you know, be able to take this thing from this culture and this thing from this culture and this thing from this culture and say, hey, these things all have these common elements in them. And if we kind of draw these lines between them, we can make this into a cohesive whole where it feels like it's all one piece and it makes sense. And you go, Oh my God. Yes. That's so well, that's not exactly something new for humans to do. The Romans were really, really big into that. Although they of course had to demonstrate how the Roman elements were the most central and definitive parts, but what was it called? Syncretism? Syncreticism? Something to do with yeah, synthesis. Some, that sounds... Something based off the word synthesis, where you're basically saying, well, okay, we take this and this and this tradition, and we see the parts that are similar and overlap, and we recombine them. When, and especially when the historians say, yeah, they're probably all branch- diverging off of stuff from a thousand years before that. And it's bringing these things back together and fusing them back together in interesting ways is not a new human pastime at all. So Kalfu is literally means crossroads. He's mm. uh, one of the aspects of Papa Legba. There we go. I knew it was is, one of them. Um, he is, oh, I just read it. Now I can't fucking remember. But he's, yeah, they're all Loa. They're yeah. all crazy. They ride people and do mm-hmm. crazy cool stuff. 
But yeah, so Kalfu is um he's basically uh he can choose to let anybody that's why he's at the crossroad, because his whole deal is crossroads, and he can let you pass or not. You gotta give him some rum infused with gunpowder. I wish I was that cool. That you drank rum infused with gunpowder? Yeah. Or that you got to choose who could pass and who Both. can't. I mean, I wish I was. A, how could a you Calvin. be at all of them? There's, there's a lot. I love that. Um, this uh, yeah, Drake in the swamp is not the only time that a crossroad comes into play, but I love that it's a metaphorical crossroad, <laughs> not like a literal crossroad. And I, I like the way that he plays with with those ideas because he does it consistently. That is something mm. actually. I, I was curious about. I didn't have time to research uh, today. But it would be interesting to look into the history of Western culture using the idea of crossroads, but not literal crossroads, because Supernatural uses it a lot. Um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer has used it a lot. Um, I think there's even a Lovecraft tale yeah, where well, crossroads are a liminal space. Yeah. Like, uh, I know some of the South American uh, cultures were really big into caves as their liminal space where the spirit world and the material world cross and uh, other cultures were a lot bigger into crossroads. And like, that's why one, one of the ways of disposing of a vampire was to bury them in a crossroads. Yeah. Well, I mean, just the idea of it not being a literal crossroads because <clears throat> that has been something like, you know, um, that fucking blues guitarist. His yeah, name. well, Robert Johnson. So yeah, Robert Johnson. Yeah, crossroads. It, that's a literal crossroads. That yeah. idea is a literal crossroads devil or demon. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of become like, oh no, there's these like ley lines of magic. And that's something you see a lot. It'd be well, interesting to trace the root of that idea of look, there are ley lines, there are these passageways. And like, who was the first person to do that? Or like the first tale to sort of employ mm -hmm. that? I'm sure that my mother would know pretty immediately. I'm going to guess just off the top of my head that it probably goes back at least to Madame Blavatsky in that kind of period of time with... Well, that's when they were in reinventing ley lines as a thing. Right, exactly. And, you know, they were just talking about like, ooh, the astral plane and planes of existence mm. and yada, 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 that a lot of... Um, Stuff from the 70s with like psychic powers and all the new age stuff, spiritual emanations, all the new age stuff. That's where it all comes from. That's why it's all in the Doctor Strange. Yeah. But I think there's also much more, um, strangely enough, a literal idea, right? Because at a crossroads, you can choose your path mm -hmm. and you don't yeah. know what lies down either one. So it's, it's a place of choosing. It's a place of, un it's a place where you cannot know the outcome. So of course, that's where. Things. I mean, I think Cullen Bunn uses it more as a place where momentous something has happened to make the skin of the world thin, which I think is a, a very popular usage of it. But I also think it's just, it's about um, just choices. You know, I think that's very much the Robert Johnson thing is, you know, you go out there and you meet the devil and you sell your soul and you get yourself famous. Mm -hmm. yeah. It does strike me how. Little we've talked about the actual characters of the book, at least in the first two volumes. When we talked about Drake a little bit, nobody has said Becky's name. No well, to be fair, we also went on a tangent. About Several tangents. And you did talk about liking the magic gunslinger girl. Yeah. But what I'm saying is the impact the characters have, it's superheroes as a genre is all about the impact of the characters, these larger than life figures in luminous raiment with oversized personalities and problems. And the sixth gun is not a superhero story. The people are much more, I don't want to quite say grounded, but less exaggerated. And I care about what they're doing and what happens to them, but it's the saga they're participating in is the real story. That's why it's not named after them. It's about the guns. Yeah. I mean, I kind of got into that a little bit talking about 
that there was no big character that really wowed me in the way that like somebody like Death Face Ginny just kind of jumps off the page and you're like, wow, that's a really evocative character. I want to see this person bouncing off all of these potential different scenes. Like mm-hmm. these are the people who are there in these events, but none of them really stands out as an individual. Mm-hmm. Which I mean, I guess it's one of the weaknesses in my book. Um, along with, and I don't, I don't want to say the art is bad or that it's weak, but I think the art it's, does it's it does its job. Yeah, the art does its I, job very, very well. I think the art's fantastic. I really like the I, art. Yeah, really? I thought it was amazing. I mean, it it's really like it highlighted the characters. It highlighted what was happening. It really highlights the world really well. The color palette is fantastic in all of the scenes. Like, I felt like I was there reading it. So I actually disagree with that. Well, okay, yeah, I mean, it just, it, it didn't really stand <laughs> out to me, I guess. The, the art, that's because the art isn't trying to stand out. There's yeah. some art where the art is trying to be artistic. The, the art in The Sixth Gun is trying to tell the story. And it does a very good job of telling the story. I think, yeah, it doesn't want to be, um, I think that... And it's it not so, intrusive. In a, in a roundabout way, there's a story about in Vertigo, Hitchcock picked every. Uh, there's a scene where uh, uh, Jimmy Stewart is following Kim Novak around, and they go into a flower shop, and it's off of a street lined with cars. And Hitchcock picked every car in that scene, and he had people arrange the flowers, not because anybody gave a fuck, but because that's the way he wanted them. Right? I think somebody that's very talented, like. We 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 have people like um, uh, Assad Ribic and uh, a bunch of other people that I can't look like Raphael Albuquerque and all these great really expressive artists, but I think that I I think that it it takes an equal amount of talent not to have your art overwhelm the story, and I think that with this story that would have been easy to do. I think the art fits very. It flows well, like Kaylee said. It's beautifully colored, and it's it's just expressive enough because you don't want to. The art is the conveyance of what's happening. You know, you don't want it to be. Yeah. Well, g- given how colorful the characters are, I kind of wished that the art had been a little bit more exaggerated, a little bit more atmospheric. You know, you have a really evocative character like the general you know he's this undead confederate general with an army of zombies and he's got these the you know four horsemen following him around and i you know really wanted him to be this really frightening intimidating character that kind of jumped off the page at me and he just looked like a dude in a suit well are you maybe th- wishing that was more realistic and less no, I'm Tron? not not He's realistic. Saying, I'm saying exaggerated. Because yeah. well, I don't know. Like I, f- I felt and like granted, this is personal preference. Like 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 the example I brought in earlier. I really love the goon. I really love Hellboy. I really love you know all of those. Um, and so the art is simplistic in the way that it it uses negative space and it doesn't like overuse lines. It doesn't overuse expressions to convey its point but you really get a feel for what's going on. So like the panel I'm thinking of with a general, he is dragging people behind him with glowing hot chains that are whipping around his body and the people that he is trying to drag into hell with him. And that's horrifying. Yeah. The art, the art conveys the action in the scene. It does. It is not trying to tell you what's happening. It's not trying to convey the emotion of the story. It's trying to convey the scene and let the reader infer the emotion. And, you know, maybe if you had somebody who was really on the same page as the writer, you could combine those. But... This is really, yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm holding up a page here of the general in that last fight in volume one, and he's kind of flying in the air and these, these chains whipping all around him and you can see the rain and you've got people in the foreground, but it's very evenly lit. 
you know there's there's not a lot of uh, really interesting dynamic colors going on you know you don't have him in silhouette with like flames behind him he's not a presented in a way where he's physically intimidated or intimidating like there's a lot that you could have done here the art definitely defaults to conveying the action clearly and intelligibly above trying to artistically add emotion to the scene right and i'm saying that i i wish that it had done more of the latter again and That's, you know do you know what else this artist has done because not off the top of my head you know i i'd be interested to know if this is something he did in collaboration with bun from the start or whether he is somebody that bun hired to do his script uh it looks like it was illustrated by brian hurt and i'm gonna go ahead and if you guys want to just talk for a minute, I'll see if I yeah. can find anything. Um, so one of the things that I, and like, I, I really do think that this is a, a matter of preference um, because I do actually really strongly yeah. disagree. Well, I'm, I'm, um, I'm not disputing that whatsoever. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting to me because like in Pretty Deadly, which I'm sure listeners know by now, is just like one of my all time favorite books. The action in there isn't, overly exaggerated like these are human forms that are doing things there are interesting things that happen like um i don't want to do spoilers for a book that you're not listening to um, i'll go back and listen to our episode on pretty deadly yeah um but there is a scene where there is a, a swirl of butterflies which seems like it should be an innocent innocuous thing but the fact that the writing really delivers that impact of this is what just happened allows the art to land that impact and i feel like the six gun achieves that same level of like when i saw the general dragging people into hell i thought it was terrifying not because i needed there to be flames or like creepy silhouette which granted tends to be something that happens more in like i want to say like like darker superhero comics well hellboy yeah but even even then it's not like there is a lot of silhouettes but it's less overly exaggerated like the goon things aren't as exaggerated as perhaps they could be given the nature of things it deals with same with like atomic robo it's not as exaggerated as they could be no um but i i feel like the 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 level of terror that comes from this that the characters would feel is the fact that most of these are people that are doing this Mm -hmm. um and yeah there are supernatural creatures involved there are ghosts there are zombies all of this but they were people they were people Mm -hmm. that were misshapen by things they're people or human-esque things and so there the fear doesn't come from the scope of their size or their shape it comes from their actions but i i I think toby has a point i disagree with him about how that this is an actual negative, but the 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 fear, the impact, what you've been describing comes from what the story has presented to you about these things, and not the art. The art removed from the story, telling you why these things are important, doesn't have an impact on its own, and I think that's okay. It, the art doesn't always have to carry the story, and in the best all-time classics the art and the story are both carrying their own weight but as i said at the very start of this episode this is not an all-time classic this is a good fun read by somebody starting out with a lot of promise now this is a a sophomore effort from what i understand uh and just pulling up brian hurt's uh bio real quick he apparently got his start on queen and country he worked with steve gerber on hard time and he worked on uh, with Bun on The Damned before this. That's a name I think I've heard go by. I've never looked into it. He did do, okay. That so makes sense. It's though. generic enough it might have been something similar that I heard. Um, uh, Yeah, I don't necessarily think... I, I think it's... The art in this, I think, serves its, its purpose. I can understand what you're saying, but I think if you change the art, I think you would fundamentally change the feel of the story. Yeah. And, and how I, many things have we, either on the show or between you and me privately, brother, criticized the art for failing to convey the action from one panel to the next where you're not sure who's doing what to who? Oh, and yeah. Here, 
you know, the char- the faces of the characters are not always the most expressive. Like, you can't pull out a panel sans dialogue or context and really know what they're feeling, but it does a really good job of conveying what is sometimes very chaotic scenes, and you're clearly following what's happening. Yeah, I I, I want to be perfectly clear. Like, I'm not saying that this art is bad by any stretch of the imagination. It's solid. It conveys the story, but it doesn't thrill me. And I, I think that that's the thing that's holding me back the most from really loving this series, as opposed to just liking it. That's fair. There were a few times in the first trade where the panel setup was confusing and it seemed like things were happening before they happened. And uh, it happened a couple times in the first trade and I think maybe once in the second trade. But after that, it seemed to be sorted out. Or maybe, no, actually it happened once later on, I think in the fourth or fifth trade. Because there's actually there's actually a pretty large sequence. I think it's an entire issue where there's no dialogue. Because something happens and Becky is not able to hear for a, a brief length of time. And so it's done very like a la Jendi Tartakovsky on Samurai Jack or the Clone Wars where we'd have, would have those whole yeah. episodes where there were no there was no speech. There was just Well, it happening. was what's his name doing the G.I. Joe comic who did that first. Oh, that was it was Larry Hama and mm. it wasn't just him. That was part of a whole Marvel Nuff Said month. No, 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 no. That was the second go round. That was based because he did it first, like but in an issue before we even started collecting it in the early part of the run. Oh. Did a entirely silent issue. Okay. Uh, if you say so. Uh, you're you're talking about what is honestly before my time. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. These are these are things that I only remember very big. Yeah, Larry Hama. Yeah, he's he's still around doing stuff. I think yeah. he's actually writing GI Joe for IDW. I'm not surprised they they pulling out the. That's the reason people are buying it. Who yeah. aren't kids? He was writing well. Well, in my ch- childhood or early adolescence, he was writing Wolverine with uh, mm-hmm. Mark Texera. Well, he loves ninjas. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Loves ninjas so much, Joe. You don't even know. Oh, I know well, how much they, Larry they, Hama loves ninjas. <laughs> they forced more on him, more ninjas on him than even he could stand. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a such thing as too much ninjas. When it was GI Joe, starring I, Snake Eyes and Ninja Force. What, wasn't that the fourth Three Ninjas movie? Too much ninjas. I think that was four much ninjas. Five much, but it was the fourth one. It was really <laughs> it confusing. It was really, really confusing. <laughs> Ninjas don't have to fucking count. You can hold them back. They're stupid. Counting. Counting. Numbers. Fuck you. All I remember is that uh, fucking, what, uh, what is his name? Eddie Reyes Jr. is in that movie. And he was in TMNT too, as well. And he's also in the rundown and he's like in his forties and it's just like, holy sh- Ernie, Ernie Reyes Jr. That's who it is. And he's like in his forties. And I, I me, I was, I saw that when I went to see the rundown and I was like, oh, fuck that. It made me sad. It was a fun movie for a popcorn flick. It was a fun movie for a popcorn flick. Was that the one with Sean William Scott? And The Rock. And The Rock. And <laughs> the uh, Christopher Walken shows up like halfway through the movie. Oh, no, he's, no, he's in the beginning. He's the, ma- he's the big bad. Yeah, but he doesn't really like... No, he's there from early on. I, I very specifically remember like getting halfway through that movie and then it's like, oh shit, there's Christopher Walken. Well, because he's in... I mean, maybe he appears at the beginning of the he movie, does, but he doesn't really yeah. do anything no, until the second half. He establishes yeah. himself as the the, the bad the, guy. What they're then, running from. Yeah, and then they're running from him for most of the movie. Um, that was a solid action movie. I yeah. like that movie, yeah. Dwayne, Dwayne Johnson, uh, you know, he's been doing a lot of kids' movie, but he has some solid fun action movies, The Rundown and uh, The Scorpion King, which I still maintain is one of the best popcorn flicks ever. And you're still wrong. <laughs> that movie is garbage. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't get through it, but I can watch The Rock do almost anything. Mm. He is uh, he's very, very good. But uh, it seems I feel like it's I think I feel like we could wrap up and move to recommendations. You, you think so? You wanna you wanna make this a little bit of a shorter episode? I'm yes. exhausted. Every, I'm not gonna lie. Everybody's exhausted, and you know, honestly, 
The Sixth Gun is a fun read. It's a good mm. book. Uh, I think it's been a while, but I think it gets stronger as it goes on. I agree. That's, I definitely like agree. Like I said, it's been a while since I read more than the first two. So, uh, you know, it, if you think you'd be in the mood for a uh, occult Western horror, not exactly horror, but with some horror elements. Well, supernatural yeah. Western with horror elements is what I would say. Yeah. yeah. And you can, like, seriously, I read this and, like, I read everything that's out in probably three or four hours. It just... Yeah, honestly, I... Super fast read. I started it on Monday, expecting to read one volume Monday, one volume Tuesday, record on Wednesday, and I just read both volumes in one go. Like, it's... It's... Yeah, fantastic. I, 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 I was don't a want, dense read. This I is not a dense read. I don't want this to sound like a knock because it's not. It's easily digestible. Oh, yeah. It's something absolutely. that you can sit down and just read and go through it really quick and enjoy yourself and put it down. And you don't get on have with to sit down and read large pages of dialogue and stop to puzzle out complex pages. It just flows. Like I said, the pacing is excellent. Yeah. Well, and. There are two main ways you can go with a story like this. You can go a dramatic route, which usually means more reading and more depth and blah, blah, blah. This is a very, this is built on an action foundation. So the action very much carries you along. Mm -hmm. So there's not much downtime. Nope. There's All a right. lot of yeehawing and getting shit done. Oh, I feel like that really says it all. <laughs> <laughs> so let's move on to recommendations. Uh, and we are actually going to start with a fan pitch from Patreon sponsor, Brian May. Uh, and I'm just going to go ahead and read Brian's letter to me verbatim, because I think he does a good job of arguing for himself. Have you, ever, have you ever wondered what it must be like to be an ant? Yes, I'm talking about, no, not a bug's life, not ants either. No, not sim ant. I'm talking about ant colony. By Michael DeForge. Ant Colony tells the story of a black ant colony that gets attacked by a strange and alien red ant colony down the way. You may not know his name, but if you've ever seen Adventure Time, you've seen the work of DeForge. Ant Colony is all the strange zaniness that we've come to love from everybody's favorite Cartoon Network show with none of the censorship. Blood, spider goddess genitals, an, a loving ant couple in a same-sex relationship. What more could you want? <laughs> Where do you find this shit, Brian? <laughs> My God. And I got to say, I, when he sent this to me this morning, I Googled this comic book just to see what it looked like. That shit be cray. Oh, damn. Interesting. So, Joe, what would you like to pitch? I'm going to pitch something, and I've been waiting entirely too long to say this. Tonight I'm going to pitch something truly, truly, truly outrageous. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I did not pitch it last week because you and Kit weren't here, but I'm going to pitch uh, Gem. I'm going to pitch the first six issues. The new it, of series? The new, yeah, I think it's IDW. I've it's been hearing good things uh, about Sophie it. Sophie Campbell. Yes, and it is charming as hell, man. It is really, really good. It's, a, it's uh, as... Taking source material that is as batshit crazy as the original let, gem. Let me ask is. you this one question: Do the mit, do the misfits <laughs> fuck all the shit up with zero consequences? Um, they do. Although the shit that they are fucking up on a lower, they're not blowing up orphanages <laughs> or burning down schools for wayward girls or engaging in piracy on the high seas. <laughs> yeah, like as they do in literally the first four episodes of Gem. I have to say. <laughs> Watching Jem with you that day is one of my fondest memories. Oh, God, I know. It was amazing. That was insane. So you're saying the comic book is the exact opposite of the movie in every way. Yes. No, this is a, it's, it's a great modern update. I think it's really, it does a very good job of putting the characters in a much more modern place and keeping the things that made Jem great in the first place. Synergy and the fact that she's a fucking rock star, not some YouTube chick. All right. Um, not to get denigrate YouTube not, chicks. Not to denigrate YouTube chicks, but I mean, come on. Like, it always fucking pisses me off when you're going to be, we're going to make a movie out of this property that already has the storyline. We're not going to use that. 
We're going to use something that has nothing to do with it, and we're just going to slap this name on it so that we get some nostalgia dollars. Which worked really well for them, because they pulled it after three days in the theater. So, Was it um, really only three days? Yeah, it broke records. Wow. <laughs> it broke records. Um, but no, this, yes, this is the opposite of the movie in every way. It's a great modern update. The characters feel well-written. Um, it's fun. And I just really, the art is really great. It's adorable. I just really, really enjoyed it. And, uh, I think I'm going to do six. I need to read the annual (laughs) and see if I want to do the annual too, because I like annuals because they're something from my youth. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll do six in the annual. I think that's a good plan. There are nine out right now, but I think that's the the last three comprise the first three in a new arc. So, okay. but cool uh, yeah, beans. Jen and the holograms. Kaylee, uh, you can skip me for right now because I'm trying to research something. So. Okay, Adam, I am going to pitch a manga. <sighs> One Punch say. Man. Which (laughs) has gone through several incarnations and just completed an anime season, which, if you're interested in, can be viewed for uh, free legally on Hulu or Daisuke streaming. Uh, So, I ask this as if I don't already know the answer. What is One Punch Man about? (laughs) One Punch Man is about a superhero who is so strong that... He ends every fight in one punch. And he's got it no hair. lives up to the name. And uh, it started <sighs> as a one-off posted on a web, his website strip by a manga writer testing out a new art software and has snowballed from there to where, as I said, it just completed an anime season. One Punch Man is, uh, it is not a one-joke series. It takes the premise of, no, there really isn't any suspense. He's just stronger than everyone else. Just like you know Superman or Goku is always going to win in the end, we're not going to play around with it and try and fake you out. And it ends up being one-third parody, one-third deconstruction, one-third social commentary, as it focuses... Not focuses, but it starts going into issues of what is heroism? Why are people doing this? What are their goals to get out of it? How does society deal with these things? Is it, is the greater heroism to do the dangerous thing, even if it isn't dangerous for you? Or is it to try the thing that you're really not equipped to do and will probably fail at? And... uh, You know, along the way, having a lot of very funny jokes. And as all good parodies and deconstructions are, it is an excellent example of a shonen superhero series. Yeah, Adam and I just finished watching the anime together, which we've been viewing on Crunchyroll. And I just enjoyed the heck out of it. And I'm kind of interested to read the manga and see. Daisuke, not Crunchyroll. Oh, excuse me, Daisuke. Yes. I have no idea what that is. All I know it's, is it's that a, you're like, it's time to watch anime. And I'm like, all right, I'll <laughs> fire up the TV. I have no idea what that is. It's a different streaming service. Okay. Good to know. Daisuke means very much love. Yeah. It means nothing. Yeah. So, Kaylee, are you ready or would you like me to do my uh, pitch? No, I. God, I don't know. I haven't had any time to read anything this week, which is why it's been hard. And I thought there was a comic that just had its last issue, but it hasn't. So you can um, always bring back something old. Yeah, that's probably what I'm gonna do. Um, actually, you not know fuck. Go, go ahead with your pitch. Okay. I don't know. I'm tired. I'm done. I quit. <laughs> Game over. Yeah, this this is the deadest week of the year. Kayla, you're fired. Potty has to over. Oh, thank God. Uh, no. Uh, so I am going to do something that I thought I would never do. Pitch. Up. I'm not going to do it because if I'm right, what? you'll be upset at me for what? stepping on what it. What are you going to say? I'm not going to say no, it. No, say it. I'm going to say pitch a Mark Miller book. You're right. <laughs> I fucking knew it. <laughs> uh, so I was on 
the internets the other day. This is actually a few weeks ago. Um, and people are talking about a new Mark Miller book that has started to come out. The second issue, I think, is out now called Huck. Uh, and I expressed some dismay regarding Mark Miller and his <laughs> shitty, shitty does. writing. Because seriously, fuck that dude. He licks goats. Uh, he does lick goats. He does lick goats. Uh, and some people came out and they said, no, actually, Mark Miller has changed in the last few years. He's been putting out stuff that's not juvenile, puerile, and hyper-violent. You need to check him out. You, sir, need to check yourself. And I went, what? And so I said, all right, fine. Recommend me something. And I was recommended Starlight, which I have now read, and I am now pitching for the show. So Starlight is essentially Flash Gordon who goes out into outer space and has adventures and romances a princess and then comes home to his girlfriend and lives out his life. And nobody believes that he went into space and is an intergalactic hero beloved throughout the universe. They think he's just a crazy old man. And his wife passes away and his kids don't talk to him anymore. And then a kid shows up from the planet that he went to like 40 freaking years previous at this point and says, hey, a new dictator showed up and conquered us. You need to come save our planet and be an intergalactic hero again. And it's about this old man, Flash Gordon, coming out of retirement to save the universe one more time. And to be perfectly honest, I'm very conflicted about this series, but I enjoyed it and I want to talk about it. You want to work out your conflict through us. Yes. I want to abuse your friendship for my own ends. Mm. That's fair. So that is Starlight. And now, Kayla, you well and truly do need to pitch a book. Okay. I, I figured out what I'm pitching. Um, so some of you may have heard a little movie came out recently. Like really not a big deal. Force Awakens. Never heard of it. Yep, nobody has. It's okay. Is that an indie film? Yeah, it is actually made by a very small publisher, um, <sighs> producer, whatever. Um, so I am pitching Shattered Empire by Greg Rucka, which bridges the gap between Return of the Jedi and Force Awakens. And for those of you who have not seen Force Awakens yet, fucking do it because it's goddamn amazing and perfect. And Joe. Why haven't you seen it? Why is Adam gesturing towards you? You should have seen I'm it by now. I'm going to see it on Saturday. God damn it. I wanted to see it with the people that I saw the original movies with. Oh, well, that's just dumb. You should and have I'm seen going... it and then see it again with them. No, I want to see it for the first <laughs> time with them. Um, but yeah, so this is a fantastic series. It's been getting tons of super great reviews. I've been able to flip through it a little bit while I was at work. Um. The Force Awakens um, is is honestly just amazing to watch. Like, I was a kid the first time that I watched Star Wars, and I don't remember the first time that I watched Star Wars. It was just kind of always a thing that happened in my life. Mm -hmm. So it was always, like, a constant. The first time that I saw The Force Awakens, it was seriously, like, how everybody was talking about the first time that they saw Star so, Wars. quick question for you, Kaylee. In the... Uh, Force Awakens. How did you feel when Luke kills Dumbledore? <laughs> I I laughed. I cried. It moved me, Bob. A million emotions. <laughs> See, I did not react to the Force Awakens as my first childhood memory of Star Wars, but that's a good thing because my first childhood memory of Star Wars is hiding under the theater seat from Jabba the Hutt because I was four years old and he was fucking terrifying. <laughs> that's fair. No, that can't possibly be. Because Jabba doesn't show up until Jedi, and yeah. you were eight. No, it came out in 83, didn't it? 83. Okay, so you were... No, it came out in 85. Jedi? Or no, I guess it was 83, it wasn't was, it? I yeah. think it had yeah, to be I would have been four. 85 sounds Four, like maybe me. five. If it was... Okay. Yeah. See, I thought... I w that's how old I was when that came out, but I guess no. not. I remember fucking being in the theater with my program for the movie, like my little collector's edition program going to see jedi like i remember mm. seeing it in the theater which is weird because well, i don't remember shit we need to vote on yes kaylee did you have anything well, else yes, that you wanted to say about shattered empire um it's fantastic 
Art is fantastic. It's and it's every- Greg Rucka. Yeah, it's Greg Rucka. And it's everything that you love about Star Wars. Yeah, I've actually been avoiding it because I know that it presages some things that happen in a movie and I wanted to go in clean. But now that I've seen it, I need to catch up. Yeah. Oh, man, there's so... Uh, all the expanded universe stuff that's come out, like I haven't read anything with the expanded universe, but now I'm going to read. Start with Darth Vader because that series is dope. Yeah. Well, no, I like I've read those. There. I'm I'm talking. There's a bunch of books. Yeah. They're oh, all like Gabby's. Right. Well, yeah. no, those are all out of out of canon. No, they no, are the in new canon. canon. Oh, there's yeah. The yeah new, no, we have a whole shelf canon. of okay. things that are current canon. All right. New canon can. sucks. Old canon for life. No, I'm just kidding. Shut up. I'm just kidding. Old right. canon right. is So, Joe, of the five books pitched, what would you like to vote for? I'm going to go against my better judgment and vote for Starlight, because I've been meaning to read it for a while, and if it gets picked, I'll have to read it, and I'll have to stop running from my fears. <laughs> Kaylee? <laughs> um, what Joe pitched? Yes. Jim. Of course. <laughs> of course. Brother? I'm going to vote for Jim. I've been hearing good buzz about it. Oh, God damn it. Well, I guess my hard pick isn't nearly so hard since my vote matters for shit and fuck all. So I'm going to vote for One Punch Man. Uh, and for next week, we're going to read Jim issues one through six plus the annual. Plus the annual. Thank you, everybody. Have a very happy new year. And we will see you in 2016, hopefully with more of our original cast. Yeah, hopefully. If they ever return. If they ever return from <laughs> the dark ever have a wasteland. Ever again. Note to self, make sure the bodies are hidden. <laughs> yeah, right? Well, no, to... no, no. If you bring us the bodies, we'll just prop them up in front of the microphones. The kid yes, will finally be a skeleton. Away. As long as they're missing, I keep getting invited back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, bye, everybody. We love you. We do not love you. We do. This has been a production of View from the Gutters. We hope you'll join us next time for discussion of our selected title. In the meantime, we encourage you to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr. Become a sponsor of the show at patreon.com slash view from the gutters, or leave us a review on iTunes as it does help new listeners find the show. We encourage you to send any questions, comments, or recommendations you may have to contact at viewfromthegutters.com. Thank you for listening, and as always, keep reading.